Good morning. Appreciate all the words of everybody this morning. Uh, really good stuff. Uh, just really good words. Great prayer. Great lessons. Great everything. I want to tell you right off the bat today. Today may be one of the most important sermons you've ever heard. Um, how many of you have Facebook? Everybody's got Facebook. I want you to share it today. There are people that need to hear what I'm going to say today. And I'll tell you right off the bat, I'm not eloquent enough to do what I'm about to, to share with you. I don't have the words, I don't have the wisdom, but I never have. But this one requires a whole lot more than me. I'm, I'm so glad that through the last few years, we've talked as much about the Holy Spirit as we have. And we've talked a lot about the Spirit, and we know that the Spirit is alive and well, and the Spirit is a person and he lives in us, and he teaches us, and he translates our words to God, and he gives God's words to us. And we need to believe that today, because what I'm going to share with you, you need God's Spirit to lay on your heart to convince you, uh, your heart and your mind and your soul, of uh, what it is you're going to hear. You know, we've been blessed with our three kids, and I've got two kids from before, and and I know my kids pretty well. I don't know them as well as I want to. I'd love to sit down and talk some more and get to know them and watch them grow because they change, don't they? Uh, but I, I know my kids pretty well, and I, and I know that there's ways to deal with them that is very unique. Uh, you know, some of the kids I can be real straightforward with, I can be real vulnerable with. Some I can't, you know. Uh, some of our kids, like Parker, I never give him straight on directives because I know if I do, he won't do them. Uh, and I know how to deal with that boy. Uh, you know, if I want something done, I know when to tell him to do it because he has OCD. He'll do it right that minute because he's got to get it off his head. So I can manipulate him if I want to. Uh, but, but I know our kids, and so does Melissa, and we don't deal with each kid the same way. There's no wisdom in that. You've got to know that every child is unique, and every child is loved in a different way. Every child has different needs in their life. And what I want to tell you today is one of the most amazing things I know, because this series about, is about knowing who Jesus really is. But before I go any further in that, I want you to know this. Jesus wants to know who you really are. And better than that, Jesus knows who you are. As was mentioned by Brent, folks, there, there is no cookie-cutter relationship with Jesus. He doesn't do things that way. For Jesus, there's no one-size-fits-all. You know, you ever see stuff that says one-size-fits-all? That is an absolute lie. Okay, there's no way. There are some things, I guess, one-size-fits-all. <laughs> but for the most part, uh-uh. You know, I, I've been in, back in, in, in when I was buying more bi uh, biking clothing, and biking clothing is tight. And whenever I saw a garment that says one size fits all, I know, uh-uh, I ain't buying that one. Because there'll be some little bitty skinny fellow that'll walk out wearing them. I'm thinking, yeah, I'll choke to death in that thing. God does not put us in one size fits all relationships. Jesus knows he completely understands you. And that, to me, is one of the most comforting thoughts in the world. He doesn't deal with us all the same. He doesn't always react the same way to each of us. Jesus understands that scriptural messages hit us all differently. That's why we've got to be so respectful of our differences, folks, because Jesus is. He knows where we all are. And because of that, I want to walk through some, some folks today to just illustrate you, uh, to you what I'm saying about Jesus knowing us all. When Jesus met this woman at the well, he dealt with her as an individual. He didn't deal with her like a Jewish woman. He didn't deal with her like he would of a Pharisee. He didn't deal with her like he would of Peter. He dealt with her. And he knew that she needed a man to show her some respect. She's been through five marriages, and she's living with a man at the moment. <clears throat> she's obviously been rejected many, many times. She's out there by herself, so she needs some sort of dignity and honor introduced into her life. So the king of kings stops what he's doing, and he talks to her. And he shows her that she's got value. He knows that she's a woman that's got tons of spiritual, theological questions 
that she wants answers to, but nobody will give them to her. And so he enters into a theological conversation with her and begins to answer the things that, that she needs to know. She needs to have a purpose in life beyond going and getting water. And when Jesus deals with this woman, he sees in her not a horrible, sinful woman, but he sees an evangelist that's going to share his message and convert an entire city. She needs somebody to see that she's got value in the world. Not everybody needs that, right? <coughs> some of us are full of self-esteem, and some of us, our parents, granted us worlds of value, and we feel that value every day. But a lot of people never felt it. And so he spoke differently to the woman at the well. Spoke differently to her than he did Zacchaeus, who was a little bitty guy and crawled up into a tree just because he wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus sees him up in that tree, and he knows what he needs. Zacchaeus needs to see Jesus. He needs to get his eyeballs on him to figure out who this person really is. Who is this son of man? And Jesus knows his need. He needs to be... He, he, he needs fellowship with somebody that's considered good because nobody else will fellowship him. He's, you know, they get mad at Jesus. They say, now Jesus, he's bad. He eats with sinners. Let me help you with that for a second because, man, I get tired of LinkedIn. I get all these things all the time that say, Jesus ate with sinners, but he didn't sin with them. Come on. What that word sinners means is not a Pharisee. That doesn't mean these people are drunks and gluttons and, and running around with prostitutes. What it means is they're not us. They don't do 600 and, and whatever laws. These guys aren't concerned with, with doing everything just exactly perfectly right, so the leaders call them sinners. And Jesus, Zacchaeus needed some relief from never being good enough. And so Jesus sees him and says, hey, get down. I'm coming to your house today. He needs somebody to enter his life, and so Jesus deals differently. Now, some of you grew up with Bible stories, and so you know the story of blind who? Blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus. Now, let me help you with that for a second. That's an odd name, right, Bartimaeus? <clears throat> All it means is the son of Timaeus. Bar is son. He's the son of Timaeus, or Timaeus, if that's the way you want to say it, Blind Bartimaeus. Now, Jesus is walking through town. You've got to read Mark to get this one. And uh, Bartimaeus is on the side of the road, and he hears that it's Jesus, and he's heard stories about Jesus. And so he goes to hollering, Son of David, have mercy on me. Hey, Son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody tell him to shut up. Come on, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. You be quiet over there. He ain't got time for you, man. He's a busy man. He's an important rabbi. He's not, he not like you. You just be quiet. Well, Jesus hears him and says, go get him. Jesus heard him. He needs to be heard. He needs somebody to quit ignoring his words because isn't it, isn't it easy to ignore the words of beggars? When you walk in at McDonald's and somebody's out there in their car and they say, I'm out of gas and I don't have any food, after a while it gets so easy to just never hear them. And Jesus hears him. He needs to be heard. And he calls him. And so the, the guys go over to get him and say, hey, man, this is your lucky day. Son of God heard you. You don't believe us. I'm not making that up. Read the text. This is your lucky day, brother. Son of God heard you. So he goes over there. But here's what it says. It says he leaves his, his cloak. He leaves his jacket, the garment he's wearing. That's an odd thing to stick in that text. There's a really good chance that the garment it's talking about is a garment that was given to certified beggars. If you're going to be recognized as a beggar, you had to have authority. And there's some that believe what he did was he took off this certified beggar cloak and left it there when he went to see Jesus. But I want you to hear what Jesus does. When, when, when Bartimaeus gets to Jesus, Jesus doesn't immediately heal him. He asked him a question. Sometimes we need to be asked questions, don't we? But Jesus is such a friend. Here's what he asks. Now, all of us that have friends, I want you to think about this question for your friends. What do you want? Jesus didn't make any assumptions. 
Maybe he, didn't want, maybe he wanted to stay blind. Maybe he liked the blind life. Maybe he liked not having to do anything. Maybe he was just hungry. Who knows? But Jesus says, what do you want? And he says, I want to see. Boom. He's healed right then and there. But I want you to understand in your life, Jesus is consistently asking you, what do you want? What is it you want? I'll get you there. But you don't have to pretend about who you want to be and what you don't want. What do you want? We'll get there. When the woman was caught in adultery in John chapter 8, she had to be scared smooth to death. And I'm going to assume that her day didn't normally start that way. You know, here she is, she's caught in adultery, she's, she's having sex with a man that's not her husband, and she's brought out into the middle of this crowd with all of these holy folks screaming and hollering, ready to kill her. I would assume at that moment she's in shock. You have to be in shock, scared to death. Some would say, well, she's probably angry. No, I don't think so. She hadn't processed that long enough. She's probably horrified, and she's in shock, and she's speechless, and she doesn't know what to do. It's no coincidence that Jesus doesn't speak to her at first. He didn't speak to anybody. He just bends down and starts doodling in the sand. Why? Because this woman needs some time. Have you ever needed time? Have you ever lost somebody and at the moment you didn't feel like having faith? Jesus knows. Have you ever been so stunned and so hurt that, that you need to get through your anger first? Or you need some quiet first? Or you just need to go somewhere and be alone? Jesus knows. He's just giving her time. Giving her time. While he talks to them. And then when he dismisses the crowd, and I'll get to them here in a little bit, when he dismisses the crowd, he turns and he looks at her. What's she need? Well, this lady's my friend, I'm sure Jesus was thinking. What she needs to know is I don't think poorly of her. She's probably really used to people thinking poorly of her. And so he says, where's, where's all those folks that condemned you? There aren't any. I don't condemn you either. Now go and quit doing this to yourself. When Peter denied Christ three times, now that's a whole nother ball game because Peter's a whole nother guy and he spent three years with Jesus. If anybody knows Jesus, Peter does and he denies him three times in a row. Jesus is resurrected, he comes, he's having fish with the fellows on the shore and Peter's walking off. And Jesus knows what Peter needs. Peter is his friend. Peter is ashamed. He let the Lord of Lords down. He let the King of Kings down. He denied the one that is now resurrected and brought back to life. And he's full of hurt. And Jesus comes and talks to him and, and basically says, Peter, do you love me? He's given him a chance to, to, to say the words that he needs to say. He's given him a chance to confess because that's what Peter needs. He's handling him totally different than he might somewhere else. And he's going to ask him three times. He rejected him three times. He needs to confess him three times. And he's going to say what it is he believes. He's going to get a little bit perturbed. And guess what? You know, when, when Peter says, come on, Jesus, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus knows that. Any of you got a short fuse? Any of you ever get frustrated? Jesus knows. You know, we'll get mad at you about that. Just like your kids. You know some of them are going to blow up when you tell them to clean the room, and some of them are going to go clean the room. <coughs> You're not going to love one less than the other. When Jesus is calling his apostles, he comes to Peter and Andrew and James and John, but Peter and Andrew, he says, come to me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now, why did he say that to those two boys? Because they're fishermen. He talks to them the way they need to be communicated with. They can get that. Man, I understand getting fish out of the sea. And so he talks to them with the language they love. What would it have been like if he'd have seen the woman on the well with a one-size-fit-all mentality and said, hey, come with me, I'll make you a fisher of men. What? I don't know how to fish. What are you talking about fish? There are no fish around here. Wouldn't have made sense, would it? 
What, what sense would it have made if when the woman caught in adultery was out in the ring around all the mean guys and Jesus would have said, what do you want? That's the dumbest question on the planet. What do you mean what I want? I want to not die right now. That's... But he, he, he deals with each situation independently. In each situation, how we need to hear them. He speaks in parables. Why? Because they love stories. They love stories, and they love their agriculturalists and their vineyard people, and so they can understand vines and branches and oxen and yokes, and they know all of those things. They can understand fishing, so he speaks in the language that they can understand, and because Jesus is your friend, he will speak to you in language that you can understand. may not be anything I need to hear. You may hear a verse totally different than what I hear. I have no doubt you're going to walk out of here today with this sermon with Jesus as your best friend with something he knows about you that he doesn't know about me because it ain't true about me. He turns it all so he can build this relationship. When, when Jesus shows up and Mary and Martha and Lazarus is dead, in the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, right? Jesus wept. Think about that. What do they need at that moment? They've lost their beloved brother and they're hurting on the inside. And they're a tad bit frustrated with Jesus because if he'd have gotten there a little bit quicker, he wouldn't have died. He could have just healed him. Jesus can understand when you're frustrated with him. <coughs> How easy would it have been for Jesus to have said something like, what are y'all bawling about? Y'all forget who I am? Man, I'm going to raise him from the dead, dried up. How many of you have ever said to your kids, what are you crying for? I'll give you something to cry about. That's the stupidest thing I've heard in my whole life. <laughs> well, gee, thanks. Just smack me around. I'll feel better. Jesus could have shamed them. But instead he cries with them. Fully knowing he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, fully knowing what he's going to do, he cries with them. You've never shed a tear that Jesus didn't cry with you. He's your friend. You've never had to earn your tears. You've never had to earn your sorrow or your pain. It doesn't matter that somebody else went through it stronger than you did. It didn't matter that other people have lost spouses and children too. If you're crying, so is he. Because that's what you need at that moment. When Jesus is with people, when it's with multitudes, and he's upset because he looks at the multitudes. He says, they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're just running around being slaughtered. He gives them what they need. He gives them direction, and he gives them food when they need food. And even the guys with the, with the woman caught in adultery, the guys, they're standing there holding rocks, man. They are ready to kill this woman. They're going to chunk rocks at her until she dies. And Jesus looks at them and said, whichever one of you has never sinned, you throw that rock. You see, Jesus is their friend too, and he knows what they need. They have no emotional intelligence at all. Emotional intelligence means you know yourself, you know your motivations, you know where your emotions come from, you know why you do the things you do. You are personally aware. And not only that, because you're personally aware, you can now be personally aware of other people. Jesus is the most emotionally aware person that's ever lived, personally aware person. And he's emotionally aware of these guys. They have no personal awareness of their motivations, who they are, why they do what they do, where they're wrong, where they're right. And so Jesus, with a very gentle question, you had not sin? You throw that rock. And the reason they drop the rocks is because he's made them aware of themselves in their own darkness. And he'd take them just like they are too and teach them a better way. Well, let's make it just a tad bit more personal because I want you to know what I'm talking about today. And everybody that'll watch this, wherever, I want them to know. Jesus knows me. He knows everything about me. Melissa knows me as well as anybody on the planet. He knows me better. But let me tell you some things he knows. He knows that I'm never good enough. That was given me as a gift of childhood. I've tried every way I know to wash it out. 
But Jesus knows I struggle with that. Heaven knows I do my best. I, I mean, I, I, I'm never content with mediocrity for myself. But it's never enough. And so Jesus has to whisper to me quite often, I got this. You just do what you do. I, I, I'll do the rest. I'm in control. He's constantly reminding me, I don't have to be good enough because that's what my friend needs to tell me. Jesus knows that I absolutely cannot stand to hurt anybody. I just can't stand it. I can't stand to see hurting people. And when I think I've hurt somebody, it destroys me. That's why when I introduced this to videos with music on them, it was agonizing. Because I know it's where we needed to go, and I knew what the truth was, but I also knew it was going to hurt some people. And so I'm always balancing the future of the church and what God wants me to do with who I'm going to hurt in the process. And I'll be honest, sometimes that makes me mad. I get angry about it because I think, wait a second, I've been agonizing over this decision for a lifetime, and you're going to get mad at me, and you ain't even got a dog in the hunt, man. But then Jesus straightens me out. He said, no, nah, that's their stuff. It's okay. Jesus knows that real, raw ministry completely exhausts me. It's okay. That's just the way it is. That's the way the Holy Spirit works with me. I believe I was put on this planet to do funerals. I'll just be honest with you. I believe that's one of the reasons I'm here, is to do funerals and offer people hope and a promise of tomorrow. But man, I thought about Brad's funeral, which was a holy ground moment. But when that funeral, like others, was over, and people might think, oh, Eric's being aloof because he went and hid in his office or went and got in his truck. It's because I'm emotionally completely 100% gone. And I, my friend understands. He didn't, need me talk, he didn't need to talk to me then. He didn't need to do anything but sit in the front seat while I get over it. You see, Jesus knows that I really don't have much purpose for anything but loving God and loving people. I'm sorry. You know I know the Bible. You know I quote scripture all the time. You know I believe in the truth. But I am focused on loving God and loving people, and that's where my heart stays all the time. And I get frustrated when i got to get off of that. But he knows. Last thing about me, I'll just tell you, that you, I just want us to learn to be vulnerable and, and open with each other and transparent with each other. Jesus knows that I don't cut easy, but I cut deep. And I heal fast. And so when I get damaged, he's there. And he knows how deep it is, and he knows how hard I'm bleeding. And all he does is love up on me. And for a while, bad things don't pile up on me because he knows I'm going to get over it quickly. But here's what I want all of us to know. Like Sharon wrote in a beautiful piece out back, you need to read that. Jesus knows your name. He knows who you are. He knows you by name, and he knows you by heart, and he knows you by DNA, and he loves every aspect of you. And he's going to walk through every single thing with you. And he's going to be that best friend that you've always dreamed of who deals with you personally. Because you're his girl. And you're his boy. He knows you by name. Jesus sees you wake up and he says, Hello, Ray. Hello, Karen. That's what he does. Hello, Seth. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Amen. You wake up and he says, hello, Gwen. How you doing? Hello, Mac. And all day long, he's just there talking to you. Wasn't that something there? What would you think about that? What about that, Durkee? I think Jesus would probably call you by your last name because it just fits. Because all he is is our best friend. That's what he wants to be. 
and that's who he is. It's just up to us to let him be that and get out of his way. So as we come to know Jesus, let's make sure we know that Jesus has already come to know us, and he loves absolutely every part of you, and will make you perfect if we'll just keep walking with him. This is our time that Melissa doesn't like me to call hug and howdy, but this is our hug and howdy. I got us a song we're going to listen to. Folks, we got a lot of folks in here need prayers. We got a lot of illness. We got a lot of folks struggling. Ray is still struggling. Mac back there lost his mama yesterday. Uh, she lived a good life, 84 years old. She's healthy now, but that's always mama, isn't it? And so he's struggling. There, there's some folks you may need to go greet today, some folks you may need to go give a hug to today, some folks you might need to gather around and pray with today. We'll do that while this music is on, and then we'll get quiet, and Sherry will come and close us. There we go, David. <laughs>